Thank you very much. I want to thank the student leaders for being so supportive. When I was invited to come, uh, I had a number of colleagues who said, you really should go because Mount Hebron is becoming one of our leading theater schools. In fact, you and Centennial are the top two in the state of students who come to UMBC. Give yourselves a round of applause. You do a really. And I, before I forget it, my admissions guy is here, so if you have any questions, he is the man. Dale, stand up. Mr. Benninger, give him a round of applause. I had a wonderful time with the other group. Can you hear me in the back? We okay? You okay? Good. And what I want to do is to talk a bit, and then we're going to have a time for questions. I asked them to turn the lights up because I wanted to see your faces as I talk so that I can interact with you. I begin with poetry as I did in the last session. And this is from our beloved and now late Maya Angelou who spoke at a presidential installation some years ago and said, lift up your eyes upon this day breaking for you. Give birth again to the dream. Women, children, men, take it, this dream, into the palms of your hands molded into the image of your most public self, sculpted into the shape of your most private need. Here on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face and say simply, very simply with hope, good morning. Give her a hand for poetry, for poetry, for poetry. <laughs> William, Carlos Williams said, it's difficult to find news in poetry, and yet men die miserably every day because of a lack of what's found there. America is looking in the mirror today, and we are secure enough as a country to say, as great as we are, we can be much better. I am delighted that we are focused today on the question of what must we do to bring about equality for women in America? Give our country a hand for asking the question and focusing on women in America. It's very important. And you might ask the question, why would I bring that up? When we talk about diversity, we talk about all types, whether it's gender or sexuality or race or international, domestic. But I bring up the one of women for young women because it is a fact in our country that there are still many places in our, in our nation, in the private sector and the public, where we still have not been as supportive of women. If you go, I'm on corporate boards. I serve on two corporate boards, on McCormick and T. Rowe Price, and we've worked to bring more women there. But if you look at corporate America, the board members are the bosses of the people, right? 90% of those bosses are still men in a country that has half men and women. And so women, the point I'm making to you is that as you work to be your best, I say this to women, I say it to men, I say it to people of every race, don't let anybody else define who you are. You must define who you are. Give me a round of applause for the idea of your defining who you are. People can sometimes look at you and they will make it. I am often in rooms where I'm the only one looking like me, whether I'm in New York at a meeting or whatever, and the first reaction from people sometimes is, is he as good as other people? People will just immediately assume that as an African-American, perhaps I'm not as well qualified. What I've learned over the years from my own childhood on is this notion that I must determine who I am and who I want to represent myself as a human being. I come from a campus that has students from over 100 countries. Just like Howard County, just like this school, we have people from all over the world. And I, I tell the story out of a book that I've just written on growing up in Birmingham. And on the cover are three people. And the publishers, because the book is on STEM achievement and the civil rights movement, the cover they wanted to be with three blacks. And I said, no. The dream of Dr. King, the dream of America, is that people from all races, there's a professor there who's one of my white friends, an African-American, and then one of my mentees whose parents are from Korea, but she grew up in Howard County, and they're studying HIV. This is actually HIV. We have actually developed two parts of the, uh, I've been able to determine two parts of the structure leading to drugs that can knock those parts out and render the virus ineffective. So this scientist with these students have actually been able to do something that is amazing. They have now 
We can now say that people can live with HIV because of work like this. Give him a round of applause for saving lives. I tell the story of being in the back of church, not wanting to be there as a 12-year-old kid, and I'm sitting in the back and I am, my parents are placating me with the two things that I like best, food and math. When I was a kid, the teacher would give us 10 problems and I would say, give us 10 more, teacher, and the, and the whole class would go, shut up, Freeman, and somebody would kick me every day because I like math so much, right? So I'm sitting in the back of class and I'm eating, eating the M&Ms, the good kind with the peanuts, you know those kind, the good kind with the peanuts, right? And all of a sudden, this speaker says, and if the children participate in this peaceful protest, all of America will understand that even our babies, our young people, understand the difference between right and wrong. And I'm, I'm immediately struck by this because he's saying we can go to better schools because in my school, we get the books after white kids have used them for years, torn up books. It was awful. And my parents couldn't buy my books because then I'd be different from other kids. So it was always psychologically not good to be given hand-me-down stuff from another school that was all white to our all black school. And so I said, who is that guy? And of course, his name was Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King. And I'll never forget going home and saying, I want to march. I want to participate. And my parents said, absolutely not. They said, you, if you march, you're going to jail. You're 12 years old. And I said, you guys are hypocrites. You made me go and listen. Uh, I did. They wants me to do it. You won't let me do it. You're hypocrites. Now, at that time, students, you did not tell your parents they were hypocrites, all right? They immediately said, go to your room. So I knew I was in trouble. But the next morning, they came in. They did not sleep. And they said, it wasn't that we didn't trust you. We didn't trust the people who would be over you in jail. I did go. It was a terrible experience. And yet, it taught me so many lessons. They treated us like animals, and that's when I began to understand, even when people mistreat you, you must not allow their treatment to determine who you are. And I'll never forget, with little kids who were younger, I had skipped some grades, so I was more mature, but I'm with these eight and nine and 10-year-old kids who are crying, and we're looking at the bars, and there are our parents with Dr. King, and he said this, what you do this day by being in jail because you want a better education, what you do will have an impact on children who have not been born. Well, you represent that generation. You are now from all over the world. You are international and domestic diversity. You are Americans from all kinds of backgrounds. Give yourselves a hand for being the future of America. Give yourselves a round of applause. The future of America. My message today is the way you think about yourselves, young people, the language that you use, the way you interact with each other, the values that you hold, the things you consider important will be so important you become like those things, whatever they are. My, the, the, my student, I call them my kitchen cabinet, the student leaders who sat with me this morning to talk about your school was so helpful because I thought about the fact that there are three groups in the room right now. There are some people who want to understand more about these kinds of issues. There are a lot of people who are saying, well, I really, I'm not comfortable talking about these things because most Americans are not. And then there are some people in the middle saying, I'd like to do it. I'd like to be a leader, but I'm not sure how to do it. Let me ask you a question. How many of you consider yourselves leaders right now? Let me see your hands. How many of you like getting up and talking in front of people? How many of you get a little nervous when it comes to getting up and talking in front of people? It's the human experience, right? Believe it or not, when I was a little chubby kid loving math, and when I had been in jail, they asked me to come and speak as this child leader, and I was always scared. But what I learned was you learn to do by doing. I did not, I was not a courageous kid, I, but I wanted a better education. And the experiences I had then help to shape the way I think about what we do at UMBC. Because we have the same challenges you have faced, every part of America faces, and the fact is that my campus has had all kinds of challenges. So what do we do and what, are, what is it I'm saying to you today? We must begin our conversations with an open mind and an open heart. We must understand we've got more in common than we realize, and as one of the students said in the last session, we must learn to both appreciate our similarities and celebrate our differences. We are one nation, 
And the challenge we face right now is that it is a divided nation, divided in many ways, whether about income level, whether about racial issues, whether about health disparities, all kinds of ways. And yet, it is considered by most the greatest country ever. Here is what I want you to think about. In December, I had the privilege of speaking at the commencement of Georgia Tech, because we've had so many students go there for PhDs. And I knew I had a challenge, because the audience would be divided. This was Atlanta, the Deep South. Half the people had voted for one candidate, half the people had voted for the other candidate for president. And people knew I had been in the White House with the president, uh, in the commission, and in, in a lot of meetings. And so they assumed they knew what I was going to say. So some people were ready to like what I was saying, others were ready to be somewhat resistant because they just thought I was going to be either critical of them or somehow making comments that they expected me to make. And yet what I knew I had to do was what I'm asking you to do, and that is to approach that experience with an open mind and an open heart. And what I did as I watched the faces of parents and students, I did two things. Number one, I reminded them that Georgia Tech had a special history. In fact, it turns out that in 1961, before the courts ordered universities there to desegregate, that the students at Georgia Tech voted. These were all white guys. There were not even women there then. These were all white guys voted to admit the first people different from themselves in 1961. Give that student body a round of applause for having the courage to do that. And I was reminding the parents that kids 30 years before, more than that, 50 years ago, at a time when the world was so segregated, had really wanted to do the right thing, and it should be challenging, but also inspiring to all of us. And then I talked about the common ground, and this is what I wanted to say to you. I said to that audience, as I say to you now, there are some values we all hold to be important in the life of our country. For example, who in this room would not want to see a child treated the right way? I don't care what people say about immigration or whatever, when you look into the face of a child, whether that child is documented or not, we want that child to be okay. Give me a round of applause for helping children out wherever they are. For children, okay? All of you know that education makes a difference. Whether you're thinking about a two-year or four-year experience or beyond, you know education makes a difference. In the 60s, when I went to jail with Dr. King, only 10% of Americans had graduated from college. 10%. It was 2% of blacks, 11% of, of, of whites, and we weren't even counting other groups. Now we count all the groups. So today, the fastest growing group in our country is what group? What's the fastest racial group in our country, ethnic group in our country? Hispanic, right? You know that, right? We know that one of every four Americans will be Hispanic in the next few years. And yet, only about 15% of Hispanics have a college degree. When you look at other groups, it's about 37% of whites, it's about 20% of blacks. The, the best educated group in our country would be of Asian descent, though there are some Asian groups that are not doing well. And the reason the Asian group is significantly higher than others is that large numbers of parents of students came here to grad school. But you put it all together, and this is the point I want you to know. Two thirds of Americans come from families of all races where nobody has graduated from college, two thirds. And you know to get a good education means to get a good job, to be able to take care of your families. And here is the main question. You at Mount Hebron are in one of the best schools in the richest county, in the richest country, in the richest state, in the richest country in the world. In other words, you represent the most privileged of human beings anywhere in the world. And the question, the ineluctable question to you is, who are you and what will you do with your lives? I have the privilege of speaking to people your ages around the world, from South Africa to China, to so many countries. And people want to say that America's high school students are not as mature as other places. Well, you're sitting here today, you're listening to me, lets me know 
that you can compete against, work with people from all over the world. Give yourselves a round of applause for just for being mature. And here is what I want you to think about. What do you do to be that leader? What do you do when there are the sticky situations? Whether they're talking about gender or race, whether they're talking about who you are as a person, the question becomes, when emotion-charged situations occur, how do you handle yourselves? And this is what I would say, based on what I heard from students in the last session. It is so important that you learn to trust each other enough to be able to say what you really think. That if we only say what we think people want us to say, we don't examine what we believe, what we value. And the key to open conversations is to have a guiding principle that says people should be allowed with respect to say what they believe to others and not be attacked because they have a different point of view. Because in our country right now, our habit from Congress on down is to listen to one side only so I can figure out how to win the argument. And I'm arguing and I'm saying on my campus and I'm saying to you, the common ground means trying to hear somebody else's point of view and understand what from that point of view can I appreciate, what I might disagree with, but what I might do to talk about what we have in common and also where the misunderstanding is. I'll give you one example. <clears throat> Many of my colleagues and, and friends were very upset with the election. And people have the right to vote for whomever they want. People assume that I would be the president on my campus for my students who voted the way I voted, for example. And yet what I had to say was I was president for all the students. And some voted for both candidates, right? My job was to understand the point of view of people who may have thought differently from me. Not to judge them, not to attack them, but to understand the point of view. And then to say to all people, regardless of how people voted, what are the values we believe? If we believe in truth, if we believe in respecting women, if we believe in treating each other with respect, if we believe in listening to other points of view, then what it would mean is to have the courage to speak up for those values, to get away from individuals. What is it we should expect from ourselves as Americans, whether it is the leader of the country or all of us as leaders? I would argue that sometimes we think that a person like Dr. King or the president of a university is the leader and therefore the rest of us can sit back that rather what we should be doing is thinking about how each of us can figure out the role we can play. You know, there are two groups of people in the world. There are some people you talk to and they really depress you. On my campus, sometimes everything that comes out of somebody's mouth can be really negative and I'm going, wow, I'm getting really depressed. And then there are other people who can elevate you and you find yourself saying, wow, this is really good. And I would argue and ask you to think about how to be in that latter category. How do you help your friends, your classmates, to be elevated to have the conversations that can lead to better understanding about all these issues? Because people can say things that can upset you in a heartbeat. The question is, how do you not allow yourself to become so emotional about it that you can't figure out how to solve the problem? The question in America right now is, how do we pull people together to solve problems and to deal with the issues? I want to have a lot of time for questions, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with a story about a student that I talked about at the last session. One of my students had gone to Russia, and the student had become fluent in Russian. And young African-American from Baltimore City, from Poly, and I said, well, what do your parents do? And he said, I am a ward of the state. And I had to think about what does that mean to be a ward of the state? Well, it means he didn't have parents in his life. And I said, well, how did you get here? And he explained that his daddy had gotten hooked on drugs when he was 12 and his mother left him in a, a heroin crack house when he was 13. He said, doc, I've been to hell and back. I said, well, how, how did you get to UMBC? He said, one of my teachers told me that if I was gonna get out of poverty, I had to learn to read well and to do well in school, to go to college. He said, and so what I learned to do was to study and to pray. Because when your dad leaves you, it's bad, but when your mother leaves you, you feel like you're nothing. And I had to figure out how to be somebody. 
And at his graduation, I said, well, who's coming to represent you at your graduation? He said, I don't have anybody. So in the middle of graduation, I got up and I said, all of you today have family here because we are the product of our families. I said, but one of you is here by himself with nobody. And yet he's graduating with a 3-5 in Russian literature. And when I had him stand, there was a gasp. Everybody was shocked because this had been a guy who had been there for everybody else. Everybody was telling them their problems. He never told them he was by himself. And all of a sudden, standing ovation for this young man and not a dry eye in the place because everybody could see he was so appreciative of what they were doing. He was crying, I was crying. And he came up to me and he said, Doc, I've never felt love. I will never forget this moment. Now, why do I tell you that story in the middle of something about diversity? You are by far so blessed to have family members, to have teachers who are considered some of the best. Give your teachers and staff a round of applause right now. <laughs> If my student who had nobody could do so well and go on to Princeton and get a Fulbright and now working with the State Department to help poor children around the world, imagine how much each of you can do with the support that you have. I want you to remember that you are older than you think you are. Whether you are 14 or 17, before you know it, you will be making decisions every day about the rest of your lives. Take the time to get beyond your comfort zone. Get to know people different from yourselves. Speak with authenticity and people will respect you. I challenge you, Mount Hebron, to watch your thoughts. They become your words. Watch your words. They become your actions. Watch your actions. They become your habits. Watch your habits. They become your character. I tell my students, your character has everything to do with who you are when you don't think anybody can see you. What will you do? So thoughts become words, words become actions, actions become habits, habits become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. Dreams and values. Mount Hebron, you are such a special place and you can be even better. God bless you all. Thank you. So, Let's take some questions. Questions? Yes. Somebody has a microphone. Hello? Hello. Uh -huh. What's up, Robert? Or Drew, my fault. Um, you think children possess, or um, you think children possess something that adults don't, like uh, caring for one another? Do you think like adults lose that? It's a great question. He asked the question, do children possess something that adults don't? I, I will tell you this. First of all, give him a, a hand for having the courage to ask the question. I sincerely believe that children possess a kind of innocence that allows them, if they've not been damaged by awful circumstances, quite frankly, that allows them to trust each other and to connect in ways that human beings should connect. I think that there are many adults who keep that quality. I think one of the challenges we face as adults is sometimes we can become very cynical because of experiences we've had. And the challenge we face is to remember that, that the qualities of children. I mean, your point is well taken that we should be working to be with the kind of purity that children have. It is a challenge as you get older because as you have tough experiences and you get knocked down, if you're not careful, you really can become cynical or untrusting of other people. And right now in our country, I'm saying we have to re help people to remember that pure nature of a child. I think your point is profound. Give him a round of applause for the point. Yes, another question? Do you have kids? I do, I have, I have a son who's, who's actually 40 years old. I, I, I got married when I finished college, when I was, finished my math major when I was 18, got married at 19, I've been married 45 years. Give my wife a round of applause for that. <laughs> 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 
see, being a man from the deep south myself, um, uh, how would how would you deal with um, people automatically assuming you're a racist just because of where you come from and the color of your skin? Great, give him a round of applause for the question. It's an excellent question. We have a tendency to think that 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 Southerners are necessarily more prejudiced than other people. I would say you can find wonderful people in any part of our country, and you can find people with prejudices in any part of our country. And your point is well taken. When Dr. King talked about judging people by the content of their character, it is a profound statement that we should not be looking at whether somebody has a Southern accent, right? Uh, or if they come from the Deep South, but rather, what does the person do? It's one's actions that speak much louder than words. Give him a round of applause for asking a very powerful question. <laughs> Next question. I love it, yes. Go right ahead. Is there a question? Um, I know like you had a harder like a harder life as a child, so what gave you like the drive to be the best and be like continue on? I'm sorry, I, would you repeat the question for me? I couldn't hear you. Um, I know you like struggled as a child. What gave you like the drive to work and like be the best and oh. like, keep going? Oh wonderful. It's a great question. Give her a round of applause for the question. You know, I, I always say that even, even when people have had challenges, if, if there's someone in their, in their lives who has been there with unconditional love, how many of you can say you know your parents love you? Raise your hands. There's something about that unconditional love that makes a big difference, that can support you. It really can. Give me your attention. And how many of you are very proud of how your teachers work to give you the best education you can get? Give yourselves, give them another round of applause because it's a big deal. We, I should tell you, we have students who've graduated from Mount Helpern and UMBC who've now gotten PhDs from Berkeley to Northwestern, you name the place, to MIT. So I know that the education here is quite good. The key, the key to, to your question, the answer is this. Having faith in yourself makes a big difference. When you've had a tough life, it's so important to have faith in yourself that you can do whatever you need to. I, I said this to the other group, and I'll say it to you. We have to get away from thinking some students are smart in this and some students are smart in that. My youngest freshman ever was nine years old. And right now, I have large numbers of students on my campus who will finish the calculus sequence before they're 13, okay? who are in differential equations and math analysis at 13. Now, I would not say they're smarter than anybody else. The word that I want to use, some of them have been homeschooled. This is the word I want you to think about. The word is grit. I, it's one thing to do well on tests and grades. Um, if, you, if you, I mean, with the SAT, I told the other group, and I'll tell you, I wrote the questions for years for the math SAT and for the ABBC calculus. So if you want to know about a question, ask me about it, all right? I did all of that. But getting fives on AP and getting 800 is fine, but that is not what's most important. What is most important has to do with who you are as a person. Beyond the intellect, the question is, how do you handle yourself and the support you get as you work to help other people? Very important. The term I want you to think about, far more than talking about smart, because it doesn't really have much meaning, is grit, G-R-I-T. The name of our dog on campus, the, the Chesapeake Bay Retriever, is our, is our mascot. His name is True Grit. We say UMBC is the house of grit. We respect people who talk about what grit means. That means hard work, perseverance, resilience, never giving up, and continuing to push to be the best that you can and to work to help other people. And believing and knowing that failure simply means you get back up and you learn from that failure. In fact, I will tell you the most impressive people I know have failed at something. 
If you never failed at something, you don't know who you are yet. It's only when you go through adversity that you begin to understand just who you are and who you can be. That's what I want you to remember. Next question. Right here. Yes. Hello, Dr. Rabowski. Hi. Hey. Um, so my question was that, you know, both of us being from an African-American background, we've seen brothers and sisters of our community get lost. Yes. And their heart be consumed by vile and dark spirits yes. and thoughts. So how do we help those brothers and sisters who think so negatively and narrow-minded? How do we help open up their mind? Sure. Let, let, let me tell you that I mentioned that we supervise. Give him a hand for that question. First of all. I mentioned that we have a young scholars program, so I've got a lot of kids of all races on campus who are under 15. <clears throat> but we also have 500 little black and Hispanic boys that we supervise 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and have been doing it for almost 30 years. Give us a big round of applause for that. It's a big deal. <laughs> and these are children who are first-time offenders, nonviolent crimes, okay, out of inner city Baltimore. And uh, these are children who often don't have anybody to give them the kind of support they need. These are children, in some cases, who work with me on math problems, and they're good because they have sold drugs since they were eight and nine, and trying to pull them out of a drug culture, OK, to let them know there's a better way, OK? And, and this is what I will tell you. Last year, I lost five boys. I had five boys killed who would normally come into my campus. These are boys under 15. Who, and in four of the cases, they were killed because they left the house. They got out after midnight. But who's going to be safe? in an inner city after midnight, right? So we had to work to say you can't let the boy out of the house. But the point is, I see those faces of those children. And what I think about is that while we may be helping 500, there are thousands of children, not just little black and Hispanic boys, but little white boys and girls who are not getting the support they need. And, and the question is, how do you, in your privileged situation, take the time to help a child? Because even in Howard County, there are children who need, a lot of children who need support. The best thing you can do is think about ways through your organizations that you can help tutor a child. Because the number one issue for a poor child is that she or he has not been taught to read well. If you give me a child who can read and think well, I can prepare her to do anything, okay? But millions of children are being left behind, are not learning what you already know. If you're in this school, I already know you can read well. Believe it or not, half of the students who go to college, of all races, and about 70% of black and Hispanic kids start off in developmental reading. Developmental reading is seventh grade reading. Now that's the problem in America right now, that so many start college, but they don't graduate because they don't have the basic skills or that sense of self that you have. You had to have a sense of self to get up and ask the powerful question. Give him another round of applause. <laughs> Next question. Uh, hello, so you speak a lot of, uh, about character and also environment, so do you believe that character is always a stronger factor than environment? It's a powerful question. Give him a round of applause for that. <laughs> powerful question. And this is my belief. When we talk about nurture and nature, I mean, clearly, all of you grew up in places and homes where parents, grandparents, others have told you you're going to go to college. They've given you love and everything. So many children don't have that. But the question becomes, when you see children who didn't get that support still able to make it, what makes the difference? There's no doubt that the human spirit can transform, can transcend all kinds of challenges. But it is a fact that when they're in an environment where they're being beaten down all the time, it is so hard to do it. It really is. What I always say is that when the child is from a home or an environment that's so tough, there's a need for somebody who's privileged, me or you, to give that child some support. Nobody makes it alone. Nobody in this room could make it without support from teachers, family and, 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 and friends. And what I'm saying is that it's a combination. It's the village that helps every child. I could not have done well in Birmingham if it hadn't been for a minister and neighbors and people all around me saying, don't let anybody def define who you are. I am here today because I wanted you to know how special you are as 
privileged Americans who care about other people and that, believe it or not, you, it sounds so trite to say you're the future and you're the leaders, but the fact is, you're gonna be the lawyers and the doctors and the teachers and the politicians. You are the people. And the way you think right now is gonna shape who you will be as that leader. I am so inspired by your sincerity of all the things that could make me cry because so many children, so many young people have not been taught how to listen and to be sincere. You've been given that. You don't realize that you are the product of a caring family and a caring school. Don't ever take that for granted. So many children around the world don't have clean water. Look at who you are and, and think of those to whom much is given, much is required. Give me a hand for that idea of those to whom much is given, much is required. Other questions? I want to get to you. Here, and I see over this side too. Go right ahead. Uh huh. So my question is, if you hadn't gone to the marches, would you become the person you are today? You know, one can never know what one's future would have been, but I sincerely believe I am the product of all those experiences. I honestly believe that spending that week being treated like an animal in jail showed me what so many young people go through when they're thrown into jail. But it also showed me the power of the human spirit to transform, to transcend that experience. That it taught me that I had to be strong. As a 12 year old, I had to get over it. I couldn't allow myself just to say, oh, poor me. No, that I had to be stronger than ever because if I wasn't strong, nobody was gonna make me strong. You get my point? I had to have that experience to become the person I am today and to believe that a little black boy from Birmingham with torn up books could one day be president of a university with students from 100 countries. It's a great country. Give America a round of applause. It is. A and then we're going to come to this side because you, you all are being biased towards this side. Did you notice that? Right? It's just, right? get, we're going to get to you all over here. All right, go right ahead. Since you have been to so many places, yes. what is your most favorite place to visit? Oh, Dale would know. So, so the, my hobby right now, every student on my campus knows my hobby right now is learning French. How many of you speak another language? Good. Who speaks? Keep off Francais. Francais? All right. So, so a year ago, my students made a bet with me. Uh, I said I was going to start learning a language, and my wife and I were going to do it together. And they said, don't you think you're too old? I said, bring it on, right? So Jacqueline, ma femme, Jacqueline et moi, nous étudions le français maintenant. Jacqueline et moi, nous avons passé du temps à Paris en août dernier pour notre anniversaire. Uh, you with me? Who's in French? Who's in French, right? 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 You know, so, so, so that plusieurs étudiants at UMBC parlent français, parlent espagnol, parlent chinois. So all day long, Listen to me, all day long, my students are speaking to me in French. And I'm talking about my experiences in, and I actually gave a speech in La Sud de France, in the south of France, but Paris is, I mean, it's such a très romantique, my wife and I, right? Très, très romantique, you get that, right? Right, right, I've got a beautiful wife, you get that? Uh-huh, uh-huh, all right, give my, hand, give my wife a hand for being brilliant, brilliant and beautiful. <laughs> So I'll give you a quote. I'll give you a quote that I should have given to another group from the, 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 port, the port Apollinaire. He said, la joie venait toujours après la peine. La joie venait toujours après la peine. It means the struggle, the, the struggle, after the struggle is the pain. After the struggle, excuse me, after the struggle, is the joy, the joy, la joie, comes after the struggle. What is my point? You must embrace the struggle. What you're going through right now is a struggle. Now, of course, my students say, Doc, why didn't you just say no pain, no gain? Because my way sounds better. Thank you very much, all right? <laughs> Come on. Hi, um, so I have a question about, like, do you think that America's ever gonna get to the point where like, prejudice is like, not a thing anymore, where it's something we don't think about? Um, I, I, don't, I think it's a, a part of the nature of human beings that we always find ways to be prejudiced against each other. In any society, people find, identify, they, they develop ways 
I mean, there, there's no doubt there will always be, I mean, I can't imagine a time when human beings don't find one way to be prejudiced against another group of some kind. I do think that we have the opportunity through people like you to learn what we were trying to say in the 60s, to, to judge people by the content of their character, to appreciate the differences, and to be more respectful of every person. And the only way we can do it, though, the only way we can do it is to talk about the challenges, to talk about the, it's so, I have to say to my students all the time, get beyond your comfort zone. It's uncomfortable to talk about differences. You get my point? But it's the only way we grow. I say in one of my talks about the allegory of the cave, uh, in Plato's allegory of the cave, that the truth can be very painful. And even discussing as the light shines, when, you, when you've been in the dark and you move to the light, it hurts your eyes. And that is so symbolic of what we go through as we understand more about prejudice and ways in which we don't even realize we're prejudiced towards other people. I mean, the gentleman said it well. You, you hear somebody who speaks with a southern accent and you assume the person is of a certain point of view, right? You see somebody black and you think they can't relate to somebody who voted for one person or another. You get my point? Without knowing the person and the person's heart. Okay, give her a hand for the question. So Dr. Rabaski, we have time for one more question here in the way back, all right? So we have about five minutes before we okay. wrap up, so we'll take one more question and okay. give you a chance to Thank summarize you. for that. All so right. here we go. Earlier, you were talking about how habits lead to your character. Yes. I wanted to know, is there one thing that you do every day to maintain your character? Yeah, um, I would, it's, uh, it's a great question. It's a great question. It's a great question. It really is. I have an answer. Um, the two things, I mean, and it's, it, they're the same, but they're different. I, I pray. I pray every day. I, I'm, I'm, and on my campus, we have all religions. Islam, Judaism, Christianity, all the religions, and we respect all, and we have discussions across religions about the, and then with people who are spiritual who are not religious, right? The, risk, the right of every person to decide that. But people know that I am a praying man every day. I'm saying, God help me. I spent, my wife and I, when I was, we were girlfriend and boyfriend, spent time in Egypt at the American, we studied in Egypt in college. And we watched, um, we studied Arab society and this notion of inshallah, if it's God's will. I mean, we saw how that religion was so devoted to the notion of God's will be done. And that, that is to me. I never try to push that on somebody else, but that is important to me. The other thing I do, though, that, would, that comes, and you can see it in the book um, on, um, uh, by um, uh, Shopak Dopra, who wrote this book on genes, on the, the genes of the person, and it's meditation. I, I do transcendental meditation morning and night. And it centers me and allows me to go inward. If you look up transcendental meditation, those are the two things I do every day. And then I exercise and speak French with my students every day. Yeah, I like that. So here's what I want you to do. Get up, off your, get up for a minute. Get up, get up. This is what I want to tell you. So you've been wonderful as an audience. Give me one more minute. I, I want you to know, I really want you to know how impressive it is when a large number of high school students can come into a place, a space, and act with such dignity. It is remarkable, it is remarkable that you can comport yourselves as young people who are thinkers, who believe in yourselves, in your school, in your country. And I want you to remember the quote that I have been using all of my life. I want you to memorize it, and when you think of UMBC and Dr. Bowski, you think about this quote, and it goes back to what I said at the beginning, that the way you think about yourselves, the language that you use, the way you interact, the values that you hold will shape who you will be in the future. And so I want you to repeat after me. We're going to do it twice, and then I'm going to test to see if you know it. So repeat after me. Thoughts, Thoughts. words, words. Actions, actions, habits, habits. Character, character, destiny. Again, thoughts, thoughts. Words, words, actions, actions. Habits, habits, character, character. Destiny. destiny. Here we go. Watch your thoughts. They become your? All right. We're going to remember it one more time. Be mindful. Memorize it. Then we're going to say it, okay? Thoughts, thoughts. Words, words, actions, actions, habits, habits. Character, character, 
destiny. destiny. Here we go. Watch your thoughts, they become your. Watch your words, they become your. Watch your actions, they become your. Watch your habits, they become your. Watch your character becomes your. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you.